And so Monday rolls around again. Hope you all had a good weekend. I know it's the start of the week, but, well, at least I've got a story ready for you. And I'll hope that'll ease you into things nice and easy. <laughs> Interesting one tonight. This is the third story within the space of the last month I've read that was written by uh, Tiffany360. And this one I thought, oh, okay, this is um, quite straightforward compared to the other two. And when I first read it, I thought that, and then when I recorded, I also thought it. But then, when I was editing, I thought, oh, hang on a minute, there's more to this than meets the eye. So, I hope you're going to listen carefully and find the hidden meaning behind the words. Okay, my dear friends, sit back and relax with your favorite drink, because now it's time to listen. Macon, Georgia, obituary March 6th, 2009. Ellen Kirby Smith, 57, passed away in her home on March 4th. Ellen died the way she lived, an insufferable bitch. She was not surrounded by loved ones, only a daughter who happened to be there, driven by guilt more than love. Ellen's other two children were out of the country, and couldn't be bothered. Her time on earth was not spent giving to others or loving and adoring her children, but always chasing a husband, or in the case of her last relationship, a much younger lover, Patrick. Patrick, to whom she probably left everything because if she stayed true to form, she hoped to win him back even from the great beyond. She spent more time at high society galas than at the playground with her three children. She was money-grabbing, self-absorbed and outright vicious, a mouth filled with sharp knives that cut to the core. If you've ever seen Mommy Dearest, imagine Joan Crawford, but cold and neglectful. At a funeral, she will be remembered as a sunshine and roses kind of gal. But that's because people didn't know her. She was cruel behind closed doors. Judgmental of her children. Abusive to her husbands. <laughs> no wonder she went through three. They all died trying to get away from her. She always chose the less attractive, spineless ones. Because they all seemed to adore her. Her last relationship was with a man, decades her junior, not spineless or unattractive. But in the end, the younger lover left her for an even younger lover of his own. <laughs> her plastic surgeon just couldn't turn back time. He could only make it a little more lifted and tighter. But he wasn't God and he couldn't make her 26. With no one left to kiss her ass, Ellen gave up and decided to die rather than live a normal life. Ah, that's what I wanted the obituary to say. I'd thought about it for years, but in the end I just looked at the funeral home director and said, I gave you the date and place of birth. A little about her public life. And you have the date of death. Uh, write what you want. I'm not very good with words. <laughs> not for her. Not now, I thought. The sun was shining when I left the funeral home. It was warm for March, even in Georgia. I stood in the parking lot, outside Mother's Cadillac, and took in the heat and comfort of the midday sun. It was a beautiful day to say goodbye to her. <laughs> it was as if God himself was saying to me, Celebrate. You are free. And so celebrate I did. I called up my best friend from high school, Sarah. And we met for tapas and drinks. Sarah understood I wasn't celebrating the death of someone, but my own liberation. As long as Ellen was alive, I felt chained, shackled to the past. 
A past I desperately wanted to understand. A past I would never comprehend. Sarah knows me, and she knows the heart I have for others. She knows me to be nothing but kind, loving, compassionate. I'm not sure where I got it because I learned nothing of love from good old mommy. Sarah offered to follow me back to the house and spend the night, but I didn't need companionship. I wanted to relax, turn the music up as loud as I wanted, grab the bottle of vodka in Mother's nightstand, and dance in my underwear up and down the stairs. Hmm. I wanted to do everything I never could do with Ellen around. I arrived back at Mother's home. Unlocking the large, meticulously carved wooden door with long, black, custom-made iron handles. I pushed the door open and entered the foyer. Her precious marble foyer. Normally, she would have me remove my shoes. She even hated the sound of someone's high heels click-clacking on the floor as they competed with her own voice. And no one competed with Ellen. I studied the bust of the Roman Emperor Claudius. I ran my finger along his nose. <laughs> Ellen would have lost her mind had she seen me do that. But I did it because I could. Mother really loved studying ancient Rome. And for some reason she was quite endeared when it came to Claude. <laughs> I hope she gets to meet him, and they can exchange stories about how ill-treated they were. Though I do believe Claudius was actually a victim in many circumstances, unlike Mother. Any victimization that came to Mother was her own doing and no one else's. I walked along the hallway, examining the walls. She had very few photos of us around the house. We were never perfect enough in our pictures, so she rarely even purchased them. While we all lived at home, we were required one family photo a year, at which time she would pay some overpriced photographer to capture our family portrait. Those were always on display. One, because in her eyes at that exact moment we were perfect. And the other because she could brag about the expense of such beautiful photographs. <sighs> like I've said, she was a real piece of work. I was lost in thought when the phone rang. I reached into my purse, looked at the phone, and saw it was my brother, Alex. I answered. He asked when the funeral was, and I gave him the information. He was still in France and my sister Elizabeth was in Toronto. He promised to pass on the information to Elizabeth, and inferred he would attend if he could get a flight, and ended the call. Yeah, he seemed to care less than I did. I made my way up the large staircase. I stopped on the second floor and walked down the hall to my bedroom. I went into my room, kicked off my shoes, flopped down on the perfect, fluffy mattress, and began to cry. I cried like I'd never cried before. It was the first time I'd been alone in the house in two weeks. I'd been with her, doing my best to nurse her back to health along with the medical professionals. Even when they sent her home, telling us there was nothing else they could do, I kind of hoped she'd pull through. Maybe I'm just a glutton for punishment. I was overwhelmed. I was exhausted. This was far more than I expected when someone dies. I'd never planned a funeral or a wake or anything. And here I was doing it all alone. The complexities of it are undoubtedly stressful. Death is no fun for the living. Don't let anyone fool you into thinking otherwise. Even when you are related to be rid of them, they remain a nuisance long after they are gone. 
I don't feel that way about my father. But mother, <laughs> yes, I do feel annoyed by her still. Even after so many years though, I miss my dad. He was kind and funny. Everything mother was not. Why did he have to die and leave me with her all this time? I knew the answer. It was ridiculous to ponder such a question, but I did. I wanted my father back, but that, as with many other wishes, will never happen. One thing I did get when my dad died was my education fund. It afforded me the ability to go to any school I wished to attend. When it was time for me to choose a university, I recalled how he told me I could be anything I wanted to be. I wanted to be a botanist. I am a botanist. I remember being fascinated as a young child with how many varieties of plants you can find in the world. When Dad and I would go on one of our long hikes to get away from her, he would discuss everything we came across. I like science and plants more than most people. So I did what father said and I became what I wanted to be. I chose Colorado State for my undergrad, then went on to Cornell for graduate studies. <laughs> Mother always said it was a useless career, but each to their own. I live back in Colorado now which is heaven on earth for me. My career has just begun, so I'm grateful I've been allotted time away. It was supposed to just be a weekend visit, but now, a funeral. <sighs> Bad shit always happens to me. My job was my life six months ago, but I've come out of my shell, ever since I met a fantastic guy. At first we were just friends, but it grew into something extremely special. I never thought of falling in love. Until now, I'd never even had a boyfriend. I didn't even go to my prom. Yeah, I was that girl. But I didn't care about those things. Not ever. Until recently, as I said, I finally have a great guy that really gets me. He loves nature, plants, science, and me. <laughs> Nerdy me. I don't know why. He's handsome, smart, owns his own business. Yet he says there is just something about me. He actually appreciates my insecurities. Understands how I feel about my life growing up. It seems he really does get me. <sighs> I become giddy just thinking about him. But enough about that. Back to this mess with my mother. After I cried all I could, I dried my face. Left my room and headed toward the back staircase of the house. This staircase, which leads to the attic, actually is an enormous room, which is lovely, but we call it the attic. I could see the boxes against the back wall, each labeled appropriately. Giant boxes marked Ellen High School, Ellen University, Ellen Wedding Alexander, my father, Wedding Martin, stepdad number one. Wedding, Joseph, stepdad number two. There was another box as well. Wedding, Patrick. But that was empty. He dumped her a while back. Each box had the photos, the dress, the dried flowers, anything and everything she could salvage from her multiple weddings. There were other, smaller boxes as well. <laughs> One for each of the children she gave birth to, but nothing too elaborate. A few school pictures, a yearbook, 
small items like that. I walked past the wedding boxes. There was a long wooden shelf above them. The box I wanted was too high up, so I grabbed a step stool so I could reach it. I pushed the boxes and containers in front of it out of the way. When I finally got the small cigar box down, I opened it. I pulled out all the items until I found the ever so tiny bottle. The label, now faded, had a very faint number. 1992-09-06. That date was just days before my father died. The bottle once contained arsenic. I looked at the bottle and I whispered, I got it, Daddy. You can rest now. I closed the box and placed it back where it had been. Months ago, once I discovered she was the one who'd taken my father away, I knew that I had to make her pay for what she'd done. I would not let the bitch who killed my father get away with it. I decided revenge was the only thing that would put my long-suffering mind to rest and allow my dad peace in the afterlife. Ah, oh, Patrick. Yes, that Patrick. And I were very close by this time. And when I shared with him what I'd found, he decided to break it off with Ellen for good. He'd promised me he would eventually, and keep the promise he did. The following day, Mother was splayed across her bed wearing nothing but chiffon and tears. <laughs> it was nice. Most especially because she never suspected I knew about the arsenic, or that I'd stolen Patrick from her. To some, it might sound unseemly to take your mother's boyfriend. But truth is, they hadn't really been together in months by the time Patrick and I fell in love. The second truth, I felt no shame. She never deserved him. Now, you might assume I killed her with arsenic, but no, <laughs> no, no. We killed her, but not with arsenic. I got my idea when Patrick and I decided to be adventurous in our lovemaking and go into the woods. We stumbled across wild-growing, deadly mushrooms. I said, oh, I should feed her those. Then she could die like her buddy, Claudius. What started as an off-handed comment turned into an idea. An idea that turned into an action. Patrick is a landscaper. <laughs> I'm fully aware of how cliche that is. So, he went back to the woods that evening, retrieved the fungi, properly of course, and brought them to me after Ellen had fallen asleep. We made love that night like it was our first time, when in actuality our first time was months prior. You see, Mother loved a good salad. She was also hopeless when it came to anything domestic such as preparing food. The day after Patrick brought me the mushrooms, I made for her a beautiful salad like the loving, dutiful daughter that I am. <gasps> Was. Once she fell ill, the painful cycle of death arrived. The days and nights were long. The worried looks, the tears, they were difficult too. Acting is so hard. I was worried I'd made the wrong decision, that I might get caught. But the doctors would never think of poisonous mushrooms. And even if they did, I'm a professional and would have noticed instantly had there been a poisonous mushroom anywhere near the house. She'd been a drinker and a pill popper. Her heart and lungs weren't great. She had a history of severe GI issues. So, even though the doctors had a million questions, they believed her bad habits and poor health had finally caught up with her. 
never once did poison of any kind enter the conversation. <sighs> I wonder if it will when she meets Claudius. After all, it was the source of his demise. Well, on the face of it, that was pretty straightforward, like I said, but there's a little bit more to it than meets the eye, or meets the ear, I should say. So, if you feel like it, go back and give it a second listen and tell me what you think. I'm waiting to respond to all those comments. <laughs> now, you have a nice evening. Sleep well and have sweet dreams. I'll see you all again on Wednesday. But for now, bye-bye.